I'm sharing my screen here. All right, I assume Working. you guys yep. see everything. Okay, I spent a stupid amount of time on this chapter, um, partly because I made a really pretty table and you all better appreciate it. Um, and, and, part, and that's not that exciting actually. I was really annoyed when I found out that Hadley had pretty much made the exact same table later on in the chapter. But um, also partly because I, I found some of the examples I was struggling to find, figure out like why this was relevant. And so I kind of, um, as I've done in kind of previous chapters, I went a little rogue with some of the examples because I, I wanted to kind of apply things in a way that made sense to me. Um, and so hopefully uh, it also makes sense to you. So today we're talking about quasi quotation and we're gonna cover kind of what it is, why we use it and kind of cover some sort of more practical purposes. We are using the rlang and the per package. Um, uh, per for some of the examples only. Um, our lang, I'm, we can do a lot of like quoting and unquoting with base as well, but it is kind of different. And generally speaking, quasi quotation doesn't exist in base with one very small exception. So most of what I'm doing today is going to be covering um, the our lang implications or, or applications of this rather than the our base, but I do include our base uh, options wh where they popped up in the chapters. So uh, they were talking about there's three pillars of tidy evaluation. We've got the quasi-quotation closures and data masks. So today we're doing quasi-quotations and next week we'll have closures and data masks. And quasi-quotation is really meaning just like they are essentially quotation. They, they in, the, in the book, they said it was like quotation and unquotation combined. To me, I think of it a little bit more like quotation with the option to unquote it because you don't actually unquote it. So for me, quasi-quotation is the way of capturing an expression um, with an option of later on sort of uh, evaluating parts, selective parts of that expression if you wanted to. Um, so one thing that these slides had before I kind of came and ripped them all apart was they were talking a lot about non-standard evaluation. And that's always the way I've talked about it too. So essentially the tidy eval, um, the you know the tidy verse kind of way of doing things. And essentially anytime you use like sort of quotation, it's generally considered non-standard evaluation. Um, but in the book, he was talking a lot about kind of referring it more to like quoting functions as opposed to non-standard evaluation. Um, so that's, that's kind of the terminology. There's sort of two ways of different of thinking about these terms. So non-standard evaluation and sort of quoting functions. Um, they also mentioned that this is related to Lisp, Lisp macros, um, uh, which also uh, exists in other languages. I'm not familiar with any of those, but um, it is kind of relevant if you do have experience with other languages. Um, one thing that I thought was important to remember was that like quasi-quotation is really good for programming. So if you are looking at this chapter and you don't really program, like you don't really make your own functions or packages or something like that, some of the usages in here might seem like a little like, why, why do we care? Um, but from what I understand, when we combine it with some of these other tools we're going to be learning on down the road, that's when it comes in um, like really important for sort of data analysis. And so if you are feeling right now, like I don't really need to know this, like it doesn't seem relevant, um, I, apparently, hold tight, it will it will become relevant. I'm, I definitely use this in a programming context. So that's why I wanted to take this chapter and learn a lot about it. Yeah, maybe, maybe a point here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you make a good point. Like maybe if you're just using R for analysis, you maybe do not need it. Mm -hmm. uh, except if you are like sometimes want to do fancy stuff with divers, which like happens uh, a lot. And I think like, What's 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 important to take? I mean, from me, like at that point, I don't know what others think. It's like what's Adley use it and other people, like it's it's mostly like build their own domain specific language. That's the tidyverse, it's a domain specific language for data frame. And and but there are other cases, like for example, people like that use that uh to interact with SQL. Mm -hmm. 
that's all deep layers like generate SQL codes. Uh, I think this is used. So if you want at one time to build, and I think this is why Lisp is famous for, like the Lisp macro, you just basically build your own data uh, specific languages around stuff. So. I also yeah, have I an example. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I also went rogue on my version of the case studies at the end because there was a problem oh, I had during my PhD when I wanted to run a bunch of linear models and get the output and the printing of those linear models to match what would happen if you ran it sort of by hand, but run, run them programmatically. And so I was able to, took me a long time, but I was able to figure out how to make all this stuff work to make that happen. And that I think is a real data science, um, you know, example there. And I was just, it was very satisfying to like, you know, almost 15 years down the road to like well, not 15 years, I guess, almost 10 years, sorry, almost 10 years down the That's road. That's good that you can uh, look back at your old codes like that. I would be afraid to look my Oh, I didn't look at my old code. I didn't look at my old code. I just remember the frustration. I remember the frustration of trying to achieve something I couldn't achieve. And so I was like, I wonder if I can solve that problem here. And I did very late. Well, not late last oh. night, but I was supposed to make dinner and I didn't. My spouse made dinner because I was like, I need to figure this out. <laughs> anyway, so um, a concrete ha, 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 example using, um, we're going to create a function called cement. And uh, we are, this is an example of what kind of quoting is. Um, so we're going to make a, an example uh, called, uh, sorry, an example function called cement that is essentially, I think of it as a mirror image of paste. It does the same thing, but instead of uh, with paste where you put everything in quotes, in this case, we're going to um, just give it unquoted variables and cement is a function that will apply the quoting. So cement is a quoting function. So um, we think of this as automatically applying quotes to the argument. So everything gets like its actual quotes around it. Um, we do that by using the nSims function. In this case, nSims um, is very similar to the nExpress that we've been using. Um, it just only, um, it's a little bit uh, more picky as a function. It requires that it's getting a single value. Um, instead of say a list or um, an expression. Um, so in this case, we create this function that can say, you know, can cement good morning Hadley together. But the problem here, and you may have, if you've been, if you in the past have used like tidyverse functions and you want to pass in a variable that has like a text string that kind of calls column name, for example, you would have run into this kind of problem is, how do you pass it a variable instead of just, you know, because it's already quoted. So how does it know to actually take the contents of an object rather than just like treat that object like a symbol? Um, so that's where we unquoting comes in. So in this case, if we have this variable name where we want it to be sort of dynamic that way, we have to unquote name and we say, or avoid quoting name. So I always love these names, so that's the bang bang. Um, and that's where unquoting comes in. So I like to think of this as being uh, like cement and paste are mirror images of each other. Um, paste defines, um, uh, define, in paste, if you're using paste, you have to sort of define what gets quoted. So you have to actually do the quoting yourself. Um, and it evaluates everything immediately. In cement, you actually have to define what is unquoted. So everything is quoted automatically and you have to specify what should not be quoted. And um, everything is quoted automatically and not evaluated until it's sort of used later on. So that's kind of like a, an important distinction. So um, quoting function is a term that is similar to, but Hadley that says more precise than non-standard evaluation. Hadley doesn't like defining things by what they're not, which I, I get, that makes sense. Um, and I do personally like to know the, the term non-standard evaluation because it comes up a lot if you're looking for like answers to things. So it is good to kind of have an understanding of, of what that is. Um, so for example, tidyverse functions like dplyr mutate and tidyr pivot longer, these are all quoting functions. Um, base functions also can be quoting functions. Um, uh, so like library subset with, these are all uh, functions that have, uh, that do quote their variables or at least some of them. And uh, coding function arguments can, the, the, the kind of the, the easiest way to figure out whether or not your function is using coding function, uh, sorry, if your function is using, is a quoting function or not, 
is to explore how those arguments work outside the function. So in our cement example, we cannot run that argument outside of the function. We'll get an error. Um, but in paste, we can. We can run the argument outside of the function. We won't get an error. And the same thing you can think of it applies to like library or deplay or mutate, things like that. You can't run them outside of the context of that uh, function. So there's my fancy table, and I realize it is not fancy enough to warrant it all the amount of time I spent on it, but there it is. <laughs> um, so quoting is this idea of capturing expressions without evaluating them. So we did cover that a little bit before in our thinker big picture. Um, and there's a bunch of different functions we can use to do this. Um, the, in this table here, all the non-base functions are from Arlang, and I've kind of organized them here by whether or not you have multiple uh, objects that you are uh, quoting or quasi-quoting, um, and whether or not you're doing it as like the developer, or whether you're expecting the user to do it. And another way of thinking about that is like, if you are the developer, these functions are taking expressions from you, or that you can think of them as being direct, they're fixed values, um, and it's used when you're in, in interactive situations. Um, so that would be like expression, expre expressions, um, and then the our base equivalents of those are quote and substitute. On the other hand, we have sometimes when we're working programmatically, these are uh, values are taken from the user. Um, they're sort of indirectly passed, often passed through a function, um, and they can vary, right? Like in our cement example, we had that name argument that can vary, it's dynamic. Um, and so these are often programmatic. And so when we're using those kind, when we're dealing with quoting functions in that ex situation, we want to use an expression, an expressions, um, or if we're dealing with symbols, and I haven't, I, I actually think this exists, the, the equivalent here, I learned this sort of late last night and I didn't think to update this, is sim and sims. <clears throat> and I actually think I used that in the example. Um, nsim and then nsims are used by the, the user here. And then there's also a list and as list substitute, which I'm almost certain I have actually used this in like a shiny app when I got really creative and I'm not sure I want to, <laughs> to explore in too much detail. Can I ask a question, um, Sophie? Yeah, go for it. I'm not totally sure what my question is. <clears throat> so the whole point of the chapter is that we need to talk about objects that like have these kind of weird they're like they're they're strings but they're not strings they're like and they're sort of objects but they're not objects they're expressions they're expressions right right yeah. so we're talking about expressions and so <clears throat> This table right here says that there's like, if you add those sim and sims back in, there's 12 different functions in uh, R that yeah. will help us to navigate expressions in the appropriate ways. I would say that there's more like there's eight or there's four, depending, because generally speaking, you're not gonna use all 12. What you would use is these these top eight here are from Arlang. And so generally you're going to use either Arlang or, or base. You're not gonna go back and forth between them um, unless you have a really specific use case. So think of it as being eight or four. Right. Um, and then the only difference between these ones and these ones is yeah. that the is that you these are sort of the generic ones, these guys up here they can be used for any kind of expression, including an expression that is just like X. These ones are, much, they're pickier and they have more constraints on it. And so a symbol cannot be an expression. So X plus Y is an expression, X yeah. is a symbol. So these ones will capture X plus Y as well as X. And these ones will give you an error if you try to pass an expression. So they're just a little bit more picky so that if you really want it to be, it cannot be X plus Y, it really just has to be X, then you're gonna use these ones. If it can be more and, flexible, and, you can use those ones. And the symbol is like the name of the object. Yeah, exactly. 
So in your example with um, cement, would good be a symbol? Yep. Because it's the name of an, it could be the name of an object. It's a single but, value. But it's not object. an object. Right now it is not. Yes, that's why it's an error. If yeah. You, next slide, it's an error. Yeah, so it's not an object that exists but it is a symbol and symbols can refer to the names of objects, but they're not necessarily like, um, okay. so it is a symbol, but it's not necessarily an object, but the name <laughs> of an object is a symbol. Does that make right. sense? Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, uh, maybe it's useful like to remember, like we are in the meta programming lang uh, meta programming part of the book, which is basically programming with the, uh, ob the language objects. And what is like, I feel confusing, especially in R, but that's not the case, for example, in Lisp, is like you are like, uh, you want to have some easy access to the language. That's why, like, you want to name stuff and it will be fluent, like, when you are doing a data analysis, but you also want to have, like, um, an access to the language. And that's why, like, I think you need for, to have this access on the language, like, the way, like, we, the, the computer interact. You need this this function, I feel. But that's I agree with you. Like it's it's kind of an of uh you the the flexibility you gain um by not using a bunch of parentheses everywhere, and like Lisp, you are lose you are like paying it here, uh in some way. So it's, I guess it's a trade off when you design a language, and we are like stuck with R no. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. that's yeah good. I don't know if it was like idea on that. Feel free. So now I feel like I need to just looking at Jeffrey's comment. I feel like mm -hmm. I need to add another column here. I, I think this also this table needs to become three dimensional, unfortunately, um, <laughs> <laughs> with the unquoting ones. But let's just so this is the quoting part of quasi quotation. So real, These expressions. Real, real quick, can I, if I can interrupt. I, interrupt on the on that like I, I i i see like i i have this the same feeling of there's just all of these pieces and i don't fully understand how they all go together um and i think it would be useful to have us have them in a one place to see what is the difference between eval and parse and expert like all of those things that i think it would be amazing to have them in one place that defines them because i, I don't know about you all but basically when i start running into these issues um, I just start randomly putting parse in front of substitute and then <laughs> remove parse and then put in deparse and then try eval, wrap it in eval. Like I, I just never understood how they all relate. And I just try random. random I absolutely stuff. tried a lot of random things. Yeah. <laughs> I even had to make a, like, I, I told John, I was like, oh, my slides are ready. And then I was eating dinner and I was like, wait a minute. I'm pretty sure part of what I had in there was actually leftover from a previous like iteration of trying and wasn't actually necessary. And I went back and I tested it and I was like, no, it wasn't necessary. So I like deleted it all and, and pushed the cleaner version. <laughs> so, um, sorry, as soon as you said that though, I did wonder if the, the art, I, I never really find the cheat sheets that useful, but there is a cheat sheet. This is yeah. like the art cheat sheet. There's um, stuff here. Like yeah. my, my understanding here is like, I feel I understand. I mean, I'm not very good list programmers and I'm not claiming to be, <laughs> but I think it's easier to understand this concept in a stronger type of um, language. And strong, by, by that, I mean like language that's closer to the, the compilers and try to mm -hmm. make it seem easier for the, um, the computers. With R, I feel it's a bit harder. So maybe like, I think this is, I mean, uh, I think I need to take like um, a side work, a side pass to uh, to come back to our letters with another language. I don't know if it's an American expression, but sometimes you need to not go forward, but move a bit like sideways. <laughs> yeah. I think the problem for me is that this is the language I know and I don't know the other. So I got to figure it out here. <laughs> um, okay, so we're talking about quoting, which is, the first part of the quasi quoting. So these guys up here are using our quasi quotations. So essentially they are quoting functions that will quote an expression or a symbol with the option of later on unquoting. And we'll cover that in just a second. 
So just to go over very briefly some of these functions, we have expression and expressions. That's how I'm going to pronounce them. Um, and we've used these before. These ones essentially capture some code, but don't evaluate it. Um, if we had evaluated x plus y right away, we get an error because x and y don't exist, right? And expressions is just capturing them as a list. And so they can be a named list. So here I called them named them expression one, expression two. Um, and that's how these two functions compare. Then we have n expression and n expressions. And these are used within the context of a function. So these are when you're passing an expression indirectly. Um, so they're all, you would never use this outside of a function. Um, so in this case here, if we want a function like f here to accept an expression and maybe just print it, that's what this one does, um, we need to use n expression inside of that function. So we give a plus b plus c and we get it. Um, and the same thing is with the plural version. Um, one thing I did want to point out here differently is that you notice that my function arguments are x and y. And this creates a list of expressions and it calls them expression one and expression two and they're assigned those two arguments. So when you run the second function with the arguments x equals a plus b and y equals c plus d, you actually don't get x and y at all in the answer. So I deliberately did that to kind of differentiate between the names of this list being created and the function arguments. Um, I was just saying, like using function in the math sense, like y equal a a x plus b is a good example, yeah. Because like if you want to define that for computers, you need to define all of them, then write it. But you kind of want to be able to put function because like it's a in the math mathematical sense, right? Function like you write on the board, and being able to write them like like the formula uh, syntaxes is a good example. So you mm. want to write stuff as the formula syntaxes. But this is not something like the computer can take. So as a, so that's why you have all this overhead, like I think. In most of the time when I'm using this, it's with column names from data frames and things like that. Um, but they are also kind of, yeah, mathematical expressions, depending on how you think of it. I always do tell about people. It's like kind of like algebra, right? You're gonna figure out what they are later. Right now, we're that's you know, nice. I think that's what Olivier's uh um yeah. that's what you mean by that, right? Olivier will yeah, algebra yeah. expressions. Yeah. Yeah. And sim and in sims, um, symbol represents the name of an object. It can only be a length one. So x plus y has a is is two symbols. So it's x and y. So x, any other name that is like sort of like a legal R name will work, I believe. Um, and this is just a stricter version of the n expressions. And so in this case. Oh, I should have given an example of where it didn't work. If we, um, if we gave any, if we gave like x plus y, we would have gotten an error. So actually, let's just do that really quick. Um, here, um, if we run this and then we we run this, I also want. Um, you need to go there one, yes. Uh, I also want to point out in this example here that symbols can be quoted, which is not the same as an expression. Um, so that's a special thing about the nsim function that makes it compatible with how our base works. But if we gave f to x is equal to a plus b and y is equal to c, uh, we're going to get a mistake, an error, because we can't convert. This is considered now a call um, to a symbol because it's a plus b is rather than just a. So that kind of covers very briefly these guys. And I should have added sim and sims, but maybe next time. So now that we've quoted these variables, the whole thing that um, this chapter kind of covers is this ability we have to kind of selectively evaluate parts of these expressions, because that can be really useful when we don't, when we are working in the programmatic sense. Um, so what, what, how they explained it is that you can kind of thinking of this as merging, um, these ASTs. What are ASTs again? There's some trees. Abstract some... trees, yes. Thank you. Abstract symbol trees or? Yeah. Syntax, yeah. I think. Syntax. syntax. Yeah, syntax. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so the, it's about merging these abstract symbol syntax, abstract syntax trees. Um, so we can think of it as having, you know, when we have that tree and we have these little branches and leaves, like that leaf might point to like an expression. And when we unquote that expression, we're just like plopping in the results of that unquoted expression into that leaf of the tree. 
we have two ways of unquoting expressions. One is with the bang bang, uh, the unquote or bang bang operator. And the other one is the unquote splice, triple bang or bang 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 operator. Um, the one thing I found that was driving me nuts a little bit yesterday, and it's not really mentioned in the book at all, at least not in this chapter, is that you can use this triple unquote with things that are not expressions. And so that's where I got a little bit like, wait a minute, what's going on here again? Um, so I like to think of it actually as an unquote, unquote splice operator, because to me that reminds me that it it also is um, a splicing operator as opposed to just an unquoting operator. One thing to also remember is that this in our base, this is just negate, negate, and this is triple negate. So they only really work in functions, inside of functions that are using our lang. So as a basic unquoting, when we have one argument, we're going to use the bang bang operator. And if we've created an expression, um, we're doing this all programmatically. So we're using the expression, or sorry, not programmatically, interactively. So we're using the expression uh, our, uh, function. So we've got these two expressions, x and y. Um, the problem is if we wanted to then combine them into like build this up into a more advanced expression, we can't just add them into expression, um, the expression function again, because we're just going to get a new expression that isn't what we are looking for. We essentially need to like unquote these original expressions and then insert them into a new expression function. So how we do that is we actually just use the bang bang in front of each of these symbols. And that is essentially, if you think back to the cement example we had, where we had unquote the name because we're like, well, actually this one shouldn't be quoted. That's what we're saying here. We're actually like, okay, just take X and replace it with this. And then we get the expression down here that we wanted. Please interrupt me if what I'm saying makes no sense, because sometimes I feel like I'm sort of tripping over how to explain it. So um, I won't be uh, offended no. if anyone <laughs> Once, it uh, makes sense. It's just out because it's a level of up, it's two level of abstraction. Kind yeah, of. yeah, yeah. I thought uh, to me in the the very last section had that little history part where mm. it talked about where quotation comes from from philosophy. I really mm -hmm. wish Hadley would have started with that. So mm -hmm. giving this notion of like this is an apple, this is an actual thing in the environment. The word apple is a symbol that represents that and you need to be able to like separate those and work with them. I think if you would have started off with that example at the very beginning, that would have helped my like mental model of how this worked. And I, that, that to me is useful, like right here in the, some of the things that you're talking about, separating out the apple or the expression from a symbol for 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 the apple. That yeah, makes no, me, it's a good. That makes me think of the hex sticker for the dplyr pipe. That says, and now I can't. I can't say this in front this of. This is not me. a pipe. In in <laughs> yeah, yeah. The scene is a in pipe. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So I find that like usually in this context, it's it's like, oh yeah, I get that. Um, it's when it gets complicated that I struggle with it. Um, the next one is with multiple arguments, and so this is where we have like these lists of expressions. So I made two new examples here where we have a, a named, so the W here would be a named list and the Z is a, an unnamed list of expressions. And as before, if we try to just take like a function of this, the, this uh, these expressions here and turn them into a new expression, <laughs> if we don't unquote it, we just get F yeah. of Z. That's not useful. Um, if we, so what we have to do is unquote it, but it's actually a list of expressions. So we're going to have to unquote it using the triple bang or the splice unquote um, operator, which is three of them. And then we get this, um, then they're also, you can see that they're inserted as like kind of like a, a dot, dot, dot list or a list of arguments. When they're named, it's, I thought that was kind of an interesting example here is like they actually kind of unquote themselves into um, sort of func function arguments in a way. Okay, so here's some kind of examples or sort of special cases. Um, this is one of the ones I use in the case study at the very end, but I thought it was kind of important to kind of bring it up right away, is if we're looking at the lobster uh, package and we want to use the abstract syntax tree and we want to find out what is, we've got this like 
this object X that holds this expression that's really complicated, for example, and we want to figure out what is the abstract syntax tree of that, we can't do that because X is, a, AST is a quoting function. So a quoting function, if you want to look inside the object of that you're giving it, that's how I think of it, you need to unquote it. And so we'd use the double, uh, the bang bang operator here to unquote X so that we could see that, oh, it's A plus B. A couple of interesting little examples they had is that you can unquote a function call. So for example, here, um, this one is, I guess, another example of how you don't actually have to use the unquoting with an expression. So, which is something that has been previously, sorry, turned into an expression. So here, we can unquote mean, which means what we want to do is create an, an expression of f as a function of the results of this, that's why we're unquoting it, comma y. And that way we can kind of insert those outputs and we can do those operations on the fly and, and sort of insert them here. So that's unquoting a function call, but we can also unquote a function. And so for example, if we were capturing um, a function as an expression, so here f, our function is going to be standard deviation, the standard deviation function we can actually um, then later on, perhaps in our script, we would be creating a new function call using whatever function say the user supplied. And we just had a F as placeholder. So we would unquote whatever function the user supplied, put that all in brackets, make sure we kept it separate. Um, and then say, then it would be a function of X. And what we would get is our unquoted SD. And what's kind of cool about this is that we can actually then combine it with say other expressions that we are adding together. And so this is one of those examples where you can use this quoting and unquoting to really build up a very complex R function that hasn't been run yet, but then will be run later. Good. Yeah, and, and that was the part where they talked about you have to wrap your F, your bang, bang, F in parentheses there. If you just yes. did bang, bang, mm -hmm. F parentheses, it would like, essentially try to evaluate it like yeah, this. Yeah, so you have to do basically, you have to kind of break up the two pieces and say, you, you need to both do the unquoting of the F and you need to do the unquoting of the, the, ex, the expression. Yeah, I mean, that could be, if you could add another bang bang in front of this, and then it would unquote and give you just the results of the stess D plus A plus B plus C divided by B, that'd be fun. But yeah, it, it's kind of like the idea that here you're unquoting the symbol that represents the name of the function. And in this case, you're unquoting or, you know, sort of evaluating the entire function. That's where I get a little like funky in my head because I'm like, this isn't being eval is a different one <laughs> comes later. I actually had to do a little bit of a sneak preview because my other example that I'll get to at the end didn't work without eval or it didn't work the way I wanted it to without eval. <clears throat> okay. So that's quoting and unquoting. Um, briefly, we'll talk about what Hadley calls non-quoting. And this is the idea um, that of what our base does. So quasi-quotation, just to kind of come back to this ad nauseum, um, is the idea that we are quoting um, an expression that is optionally unquotable later on. But base doesn't, with the exception of B quote, base doesn't really have many uses of that. So B quote is the only time in base that you can really have this option of something being unquotable later. The rest of what base does, it either quotes or doesn't quote, but it has um, different metrics for how to decide whether or not something should be quoted or not. So uh, there's four ways that base tends to do this. And you can think of this as being pair, like one is that there's pairs of functions. So there's like a quoting function and a non-quoting function. You pick whichever one works for you. So for example, the dollar sign is an example of a quoting function, whereas the square bracket square bracket is an example of a non-quoting. So depending on whether or not you're giving it a symbol um, or whether or not you want it to be quoted or unquoted, you pick the relevant function. Can you explain to me the language here? Because if I was to do dollar sign, I wouldn't quote the thing. Yeah. And if I was to do brackets, I would quote it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's because the function quotes it for you. So this yeah. quoting function is doing uh, quoting for you. It's a quoting okay. function. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I could see how that, <laughs> sorry, as soon as you pointed, I'm like, yeah, that is pretty confusing. <laughs> 
Um, and the other option is that you have a single function, but you have different arguments and you have quoting and non-quoting arguments. So for example, the remove function, um, the dot, dot, dots are quoting arguments. And then if you give it the list argument is a non-quoting argument. And so if you have things in text that you want to remove from your environment, you'd give it into the list. And if you just have the symbols that represent what you want to remove from the arguments, so the non-quoted symbols, you give it to um, the dot, dot, dots. Um, another option is that you have an argument which controls whether or not it's quoting. This one seemed a little nuts to me because um, it, it, like, it gets a little bit confusing. So if you are giving it just the symbol, so in this case, like how most of us would do library Arlang, um, we would, it would be quoting. But if you had an object that represented the package that you wanted to load, so for example, package here is Arlang in quotes, then you can give it the name, the symbol, excuse me, <laughs> package, but then you also have to say character only equals true. So say you're essentially telling the function this is actually um, quoted, well, pre-quoted, so you don't need to quote it. When you when you build a list of package to fast and uh, do an uh, an apply on the list of yeah. the package, you need to add that. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> then the final one, and this one really nuts. Um, I think I, I I don't like it when it's not really obvious what happens. Um, that it'll quote if it fit, if the evaluation fails. So in this example, if you do help of var, it quotes it, and then it shows you the help file for var. If you do help of var, but you've already assigned var to be in quotes mean, well, it's not, it won't quote it and it'll show you the help for mean. But if you do this where you've always assigned the value of var to 10 and it therefore that won't work because there is no um, help file for 10, it'll fail and then it'll revert to quoting it and then it'll show you the help for, for var. So that I hate but it's good to know. <laughs> so this is essentially how our base gets around. So it's either quoting or it's not quoting. It's not quoting with the option of unquoting later on. Okay, so this- You know is other functions that do that or just help? No, I don't know. I didn't know that help did that. I drove yeah. me nuts with that example. Yeah, yeah. So this is a chapter, the next two chap, uh, sections are ones where I put in square brackets how I would have named them because I really didn't understand what this had to, what dot, dot, dot had to do with quasi quotation. So this is a section called dot, dot, dot. And in my head, it's, it should be named when using dot, dot, dot with quotations or quasi quotation. So it's essentially covering why, how we're going to use these triple dots in the context of quasi-quotation. So sometimes we want to supply an arbitrary list of expressions or arguments to a function. We don't know what their names are. We don't know even how many there are. In those cases, we use dot, dot, dot because it allows the user to kind of supply whatever they want. It's a little dangerous, but it is also very powerful. Um, we also need a way though to perhaps like reference these names when we don't actually know what the names are going to be. Another thing to, so this is more of a list of, of remember points. Um, and then remember again that the bang bang and the triple bang only work with functions that use our lang. So to solve that problem, there is a new function that we're gonna learn called list two that essentially turns these dot, dot, dots into tiny dots, which then can be quoted and spliced. So if you're not, if you're working with a function that is not, Sort of one that basically works with Arlang, you need to be able to turn those dots into tidy dots. Also, I saw the other reference, but they called them dynamic dots, which I think I kind of like a little bit better than tidy dots. Um, so one thing that I did through trial and error a lot yesterday was to figure out when exactly I needed list two. And essentially, you have to use list two if you, the argument you are passing into the function needs to be unquoted in any way. And I'll use some examples to illustrate that. <laughs> um, and one thing I'm not going to get into, they got into it in a lot more detail in the, in the, um, in the book. And I felt like it, it wasn't 
necessarily useful for understanding. It was more like, oh, good to know if you're going to do this, is that list2 is a wrapper around dots list, which is another function. And dots list has a lot of other um, arguments that you can modify. List2 is just essentially has some common defaults. So if you find that you want to get into like modifying things a lot, you might want to look into list uh, dots list. So where I kind of went a little nuts here was understanding this idea that um, of how we are going to, to use list versus list two. So for example here, if we wanted to pass, we want to create this function called D where we could pass um, a bunch of uh, columns with values and then have them turned into a data frame. So we don't need to use list two in this case. We're just passing dot dots. It's captured by this list argument. Data frame automatically turns them into columns. Um, so we would just give it arbitrary column names, X equals, this is probably almost like exactly what data frame does on the inside. Um, so it's probably a little bit of a silly an example, but I want to show, I needed to do this for my own benefit to understand that this does not require list two. However, if we were to um, want to pass instead of this X equals one through three and Y equals two, four, six, if we had say a list of X and Y, these variables here, and we wanted to pass that into D and we can use now the triple bang operator to splice those out. And so I, I think of it as like an expansion. It just kind of like explodes them out into being separate arguments um, named by what they are named by in that list. We would We could do that using the triple bang operator, but we can't do it in this function because we have only used list. And so list doesn't understand how to handle that unquoting um, thing because the triple in this context with this function here, that triple exclamation is just negate, negate, negate. And it, no, it's, it's, so what we need to do is rewrite this function. I gonna call it D2, data frame two. Um, and we're gonna use list two. And now we can give it our vars. We can triple bang, explode them out, splice them out. And we get this, um, it splices them out into the three arguments that are then passed into data frame, which it then turns into the columns. So for that's me, good example. sorry? Good example. Oh, good. I was just gonna say, that's how mm -hmm. I needed to be like, why do we need list two? Um, and so essentially, if you're going to be passing in an argument using the triple bang, the inside of that function needs to have a list too, or be a function that is like a tidyverse function or something that, or another function that, um, another package that uses rlang. Probably using list two inside anyway. Um, so this has the same, I was also, and then I was kind of like, well, wait a minute, none of these are expressions. So does this matter? Um, and I am saying that it's evaluated later. I do not know that for a fact, but I believe it is true. <laughs> And so what I believe is that when we turn, pass in a list of expressions, so rather than a list of values, we're passing in a list of expressions. And that means that this like one through three or the C one through three or the C two, four, six, they're being passed in and it's inside of the function that they're being evaluated later on. That would probably need some testing to actually double check that's true, but that's what I believe is going on in this case. It's the same result either way. So the other example they covered, and this was the one where I was just like, I don't even understand what this has to do with triple dots, you know, or <laughs> let alone quoting and unquoting, is the idea of using the colon equals. And so I have used this in the past when using, um, like, say, mutate functions inside of a function where they, you want to kind of create a new column. In, in my case, it would be like creating a new column, but that's based on a name that is either developed as part of the function or is passed in as an argument by the user, that kind of thing. So in this case, we're our example is that we want to create a new column in our data frame using our D2 function here, um, but we want it to be sort of passed in programmatically. And so we have the name of that column is going to be a character string with Z. And the values are going to be, uh, you know, A, B, C, D. And so in that case, we unquote the name, and then we use the colon equals to assign it to values because you cannot normally unquote on the left-hand side of an expression. 
And so this is not necessarily related to, uh, it's related to unquoting. It's not really necessarily related to triple dots, although this is one of these triple dot things. And it is related to triple dots in the sense that it's an argument name that we're creating on the fly, and you can only do that in triple dots. But would that change if it had been like, if you didn't have val there and you just had equals something, something like wouldn't mm -hmm. you still need to, it doesn't have anything to do with the colon equals. It does. The, the colon equals is, so the colon equals is not important here. Sorry, one second. Let me grab the D2 function. So if we run this, the val doesn't, as far as I understand, the dial doesn't matter. We could say equals one through, uh, one through four. Where it comes into play is this name. If you're going to, so we're creating an argument called Z that is passed into here that then data frame turns into a column. So we're creating an argument name and giving it values sort of on the fly. That's how I think of it. And you cannot unquote that argument name on the left-hand side of an equals. If we just said that, we're going to get an error. Um, because it doesn't, it, it's like, well, I don't know. But if you want to create a new name for an argument and pass it on, <laughs> you need to use the colon equals. I feel like that made no sense, but let me know. <laughs> um, essentially, the important part is that this is the left-hand side of an equation and an equation that's being evaluated. So this whole thing is being evaluated. And if we are going to create a name, so you can also think of it when we deal with vectors, right? You know, you can have test equals one and that creates a named vector. Um, anytime we have named arguments that we are working with, if you want to un unquote them and create them from that object there, you have to use the colon equals. I feel like I've uh, used this like in uh, mutated, uh, yeah. but of using the, uh, bang bang I used to use the double curly I, I guess that's when I guess like I've used to like google like some in some places it says use double curly in some places bang bang uh, yeah it's sometimes I, I guess here does it work with double curly as well you mean like this in this example here yeah so if we are going to do mutate with empty cars and we want to create a new column called z uh, or Z, Z, depending where in the world you are. Um, this is how, you, and it be filled with the, the cylinder plus the miles per gallon. This is how you would do that in um, here. So that's how you would programmatically create a new column called Z when you don't, it's an, I call it like when you don't know what that's going to be called. Like say if this was inside of a function that was like a function name. too excited here and then this would be named like that and that way if we ran f z we get z but we could also make it my name and we get my name here so that's exactly this is where i'm most familiar with the colon equals operator oh shoot we're almost running out of time guys sorry do you guys mind if I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No worries. So execute is a function that I, in my head, I renamed this to being making your own dot, dot, dots. And so if you are working with a function that does not have the use, the ability to use tidy dots inside. So for example, let's say we're dealing with this mean function where we want to create our own function where, um, uh, it's a little bit of a stupid example, but where we want to specify some of the arguments of mean programmatically, um, we can't do that inside of this function because mean inside of mean has no ability to handle um, the, the bang bang operator. Um, and that's because it's, it doesn't work with our lang. And so what we can do, if we run this, we'll get an error because it can only use, be used with dynamic dots, so drat. But what we can do is we can actually use the exec function that allows us essentially to run mean give it the arguments, and it will essentially use those in the context of the tidy dots or the rlang for us. Um, and you can also use that in the case if you want to like map over variables and things like that.
So that was a really quick overview of that one. I'm going to skip do call because I really want to show awesome. you my do call is awesome. I love do call. Don't get me wrong. I really love do call. <laughs> I still remember. I think do call a do call function to load in all of my CSV files during my masters and paste them all, like or bind them all together was one of the first like major pieces of programming I ever achieved. I had no idea how it worked for probably five years, um, but once I finally went back to that code and understood how it worked. I knew I was on my way. I knew I was like learning R then. <laughs> so I do really like do call, but I really want to show you guys my example before we go home. Um, so I will skip over it. So this example here is when I was, it, like I said, during my PhD, I had a bunch of models I want to run. Um, and so like maybe like 10. And I just, I didn't want to type that all out bit by bit. I wanted to essentially give a list of models and iterate over them and have them all print out. But the problem was in LM, because of the, the formula it uses, if you it, the way I was doing it was like horrible pasting together things and saying as formula and all that kind of stuff. When you would get the printout, and what I mean by the printout is essentially like this, this bit here where it shows you like the summary of your model, this part at the top, that call, would just be like LM formula equals like paste X comma Y or whatever, you know, it was just really useless because it didn't actually represent the model itself. And you don't, in nowhere in here, do you actually get what the Y value is in a model if it's not in that call at the front. And so it was fine, but it just, it seemed scary because you were just like, is it really the model I thought I just ran? And so it bugged me that I was never able to figure out how to put it together so that I could get that model to show the formula as it was. So in this example here, I'm using per, I create a little data frame where I've got my X's and my Y's. So I want to create two models here. One is miles per gallon as a function of horsepower and cylinders as a function of horsepower. And so this was an example here of not doing it in a function. And so I turned them into symbols. This is the way I learned about the sims. And then I map over these symbols. So that's like kind of like doing a for loop um, where I say I want to create a series of expressions um, and I have to unquote them so that I get the actual symbol value, not just Y, um, as a function of X. And so if you do this and then you, I printed out the results of this formula and we get miles per gallon as a function of horsepower, cylinder as a function of horsepower. And so that just really just this Y is just spitting in that HP version. It just has to go through the sims. All right, so we got our formula here. And now again, I'm mapping over these formula. And so now I'm using just map, not map two, because I only, I only have one thing I'm iterating over. Um, as a function of, uh, sorry, and then I'm turning these formula into expressions with the linear model function. So I'm building up this linear model. Um, I'm unquoting again, the formula to kind of insert it in properly so that it's not just F in here, it's not paste or whatever. Um, and then I've got my data here. And then I've got these models and I can evaluate the models. This is from next week. And if I summary, evaluate these models, I get the summary and it actually has like the correct miles per gallon as a function of horsepower and it's evaluated and it gives me the results. And then the next thing I did was figure out how to turn that into a function. <laughs> in this case, it took me a little bit. Uh, it, I actually, I'm not even sure if this is the best way to do it. I could not figure out how to make this happen. So I actually turned them into symbols using our base and I mapped them to symbol to create a list of symbols. And then the data, because I wanted it to be flexible with data, I grabbed the data uh, as uh, as with an expression. And then it's pretty much the same thing as before. I map over the expressions to get the formulas. I map over the formulas. Although in this case, I'm also putting in the formula and the data. And then I map over the results with the evaluation of the summary, the summary of the evaluated model. And then we get this list, printing it out of these formula. Yeah, hey, good job. This was an amazing example. Um, anyway, so I'm sorry I ran late today. Um, no, 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 it's good. Thanks. Great, very good example. I like it a lot. It's very like uh, empowering. <laughs> I think that's the problem. It's, I, sometimes I find the examples in the book a little 
like I'm sure they're relevant, but they're not like relevant to me and or, or they're very kind of advanced ideas. And I don't really I don't. So that's why I wanted to do something that I'd wanted to do in the past. So no, it's it's a it's a good example and uh, a good example are like it saves you time and make it more like uh, useful. So very yeah. good example. Well, thanks. Um, does anyone have a question? Yeah. Remark. Mm. Since everyone's fine. <laughs> well, I, it was very good, Steffi. Like, thanks a lot. Uh, all of the example and um, your like giving also like the way like you give like in how you went run into trouble. I think it's very useful. Like because like it's it's make it like I don't know like um, livable and no, yeah. it's very good. <laughs> I find that if 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 you're teaching, I, I view this as teaching, right? Like I learn it so I can teach it and that's how I learn it really well. But like if you're teaching without examples of where it all goes wrong, then you're not really teaching. Yeah, that's, it was very good. Um, so I will type 